And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. I said, tell me how you're talking with your peers. How are you experiencing this issue? And they hit me to something and a phrase that I had not heard before. They said, they talked about climate anxiety. Climate anxiety. The, the, the emotional, the, the, the psychological, the mental toll that the knowledge about this crisis is taking on our young people. This has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. all the Stu Does America merch you need at stewdoesmerch.com. If you use the code Stu10, you'll get 10% off your entire order, even if you buy from some of those other evil Blaze TV shows. Mm -hmm. We're watching you. We know you do it. Check us out on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash stewdoesamerica. We've got this show. We've got comedy bits, a new one coming on Thursday. Uh, I think you'll like that quite a bit. Um, Also, live news reaction. We did a live last night after the Kamala Harris 60 Minutes episode. Be part of the group. Click the bell for notifications, follow the page, and of course, click like on all the videos. Do that thing. Whatever thing you're supposed to do on social media, just do that. I don't know. Steve Baker is here with the latest on his January 6th investigation, Kamala Harris. Kind of flops on 60 Minutes. We'll break down her performance. We're going to start by doing Hurricane Milton. This thing looks freaking scary. I'll be honest with you. It is a giant storm. It is going right at a major population center, uh, a population center that probably many of you live in. We have a really large uh, fan base in in, uh, Tampa, in the Tampa area. It's kind of where we started the show, the radio show, a million years ago, uh, on the flagship 970 WFLA. Um, So we love Tampa. We love this area. And, you know, we have employees for this company, long-term employees who live in this area. So if you happen to be there and you can get out, I would. I mean, I don't see why not. Tampa is a really nice place, but maybe a, a time to skip it and go somewhere else for a couple of days. Seems reasonable to me. We, you know, send out our prayers, and I know that Glenn, along with Mercury One, are going to be uh, making sure that they do everything they can to get supplies down to this area. If you can help there, MercuryOne.org. They're already doing so much in North Carolina and Georgia. Florida is going to be next, so please, uh, if you have a second and can donate, go to MercuryOne.org. Hurricane Milton takes a turn to target uh, Florida with a destructive path ahead, as I mentioned. This thing's going basically west to east, directly at Tampa and the surrounding areas. There's a lot of people who live there. Um, You know, you kind of hope for a turn to something where there's a lower population uh, who is going to be vulnerable to this thing. But really, if you can get out, that's it's just really a good time to do that. Of course, this is going to take more than just, it's going to be more than just a storm. These things always are, especially in October of election years. Hurricane Milton may be October surprise in presidential battle. Now, what's interesting about this is, I mean, I see a lot of people who are like, uh, you know, worried about the the storm and and what that might do for uh, the vote uh, for Republicans, uh, largely talking about conservatives in uh, in just four weeks from today. And that's understandable, right? Like it's, you know, it's, look, it's a big deal. And not only does it affect everything else that's going on in the country, it affects how we respond to these hurricanes. If you think Joe Biden's done a great job here, might be a point in favor of Kamala Harris. If you think uh, he's done a a bad job or suboptimal job, maybe you're thinking the other way. That kind of strikes me as how I would think this would go. People in bad situations are really only won over by really, really impressive efforts and that's why it's kind of one of those situations where you're looking at this and you're saying, wow, like, you know, uh, who's doing a good job? Who's doing a bad job? And I think there's some clear answers to that. Uh, a Florida poll that should change the way you look at the election. This is from Nate Cohn over at The New York Times. And it's, it's pretty interesting. I, I could get into the nerdy sort of election stuff. And it's just a like top line on that. Basically, they're saying uh, it's a 13 point lead for Donald Trump in Florida, which is much bigger than other polling in that, uh, in that state recently. 
The reason for that is it seems like those are lower quality polls that are showing it closer. Um, uh, they're, re they're relying on old data, um, you know, uh, recall of previous votes, and that's not the most uh, the, the, the optimal way to, to do this. This is more of a traditional high quality poll. And, you know, typically speaking, uh, Nate Cohn does a good job and, and the New York Times data department is much better than many of their other departments. That being said, um, one of the things they're, they're talking about in the article and Nate Cohn is talking about is in the same poll, they show Kamala Harris up by three points nationally. Now, normally that would be very strange because if you'd say uh, Kamala Harris is winning, she'd probably be close in Florida, not getting blown out like she uh, seems to be in this poll. What Nate Cohn's point is, is that Republicans and Trump in particular have really started to run up the margins in states like Florida and have had made um, decent gains in states like New York, major population states that don't have a real chance of flipping. So, you know, Florida is going to probably be red uh, no matter what. Um, and New York is probably going to be blue no matter what. Republicans are picking up lots of votes in those two states, which is good, but not enough to change New York, and nothing, it's not going to do anything except expand the margin in Florida, which makes you think if those votes are coming from there and he's still losing by three points nationally, is he suffering in some of these swing states? That's the worry if you're a Trump supporter. On the other hand, when you have a big flu uh, election like this and, and you have a big natural disaster that happens right before that, we've obviously seen that many, many times. When that happens, usually the party seen as responding better to that outcome, uh, to that uh, storm, is the one that improves their election prospects. We saw that um, back in the uh, Obama um, 2012 election. Um, as it was, you know, Chris Christie famously kind of came out and overly praised Barack Obama for how wonderful he was trying to get stuff for his state. And did that cause uh, the difference, make the difference in the election? It could have. It was a pretty close election. Uh, and, but Barack Obama wound up winning it. We've seen this in other cases as well. And, and right now, I think the, the vibe of the people in North Carolina and Georgia, both swing states, is that so far this has not been a pretty a very good response from the federal government. Now, in Florida, that case has been different. Don, Ron DeSantis has been doing a, a really good job. In fact, he's really been good at this from the beginning. It's been a strength of, of DeSantis. He's been a good governor, I believe, uh, for a lot of different reasons. But this used to be the thing that kind of separated partisan politics from real life. When people would look at something like a storm coming down and the governor reacting well and doing a good job, Generally speaking, that would push uh, even moderates and some on the other side to look at that governor and say, I might not like his policy on whatever abortion, but I got to say, when it comes down to it and we really need somebody to step up and make sure that you know, we're doing better, Ron DeSantis has been there every step of the way. He's shown a lot of incompetence. This is his game. You know, it, you know, it's funny because a lot of times the left will refer to the right as anti-government. And at times, honestly, kind of feel like that way because um, they're really annoying. And they do a terrible job. But what we would really like is a small government, a limited government, and also a competent government. If you can kind of nail those three, I'm pretty much okay with it. I don't need no government. I'm not an anarchist. Um, I look at this and I say, well, I would like a limited government. Uh, DeSantis kind of exemplifies that. He, has, he doesn't do all that much to you if you're trying to run a business, you're trying to do uh, a, a bunch of stuff in your state, you can pretty much do what you want, with some limitations, of course. Uh, but at the end of the day, when it comes down to management of the state, he just is a good governor. And I don't even mean that in the state of like the big capital G governor. He just governs well. He's really good at that type of stuff. It's where he excels. Um, and we will see if that actually uh, holds and uh, through this next storm, which does look really, really like in another category uh, for the people of Tampa and Orlando and West Palm and all the way across the middle of that state. Now, Harris and DeSantis are fighting over hurricane relief calls. It's kind of a somewhat amusing story. Basically, Kamala Harris says she tried to call Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis says he wasn't aware of it, uh, so he didn't answer because he didn't even know it occurred. Um, uh, she says it did. Uh, his point now is like, well, she hasn't called me for any other storm the entire time she's been in office. Why would I expect to call now? Like, she doesn't, that's not been what she does. She takes the day off when it comes to uh, calling governors in the states. This has not been what she's done as vice president. Why would I think she was going to do it now? And it's interesting because uh, 
both Ron DeSantis and Joe Biden have been trading compliments. DeSantis has been saying, actually, you know, they've given us everything we need leading up to the storm. And Biden is saying, actually, I think the Florida governor is doing a good job. A lot of people are reading that as Biden um, getting pissed about Kamala basically dumping his legacy to win in this election. That is something that does look like it's happening at this point. We saw reporting from this uh, a week or two ago where Biden people leaked like crazy that they were uh, disappointed. They still wanted her to win, but they were disappointed in the way that she was abandoning him. She's made no real change in that respect. Uh, so that does seem to be going the wrong direction now as far as that relationship. I will say, um, today she was on The View and you've heard me rant about this probably 10 times on this show and five times on radio. The one question, if I could get any question into Kamala Harris would be this. Can you give us an example, several examples, of things that you would have done differently uh, than, than Joe Biden? What policies did you want to pursue that he stopped you from pursuing? You, you know, what, what's, if you're the change candidate, right, like, name them. She was asked this, of, on, of all places, the freaking view. And the view asked this question, and uh, she said, I can't think of anything that I've disagreed with him on, which is like, you could just have her saying, I can't think of anything I disagree with Biden on. Hi, I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. That's a whole ad. You don't need anything else on top of that. The overwhelming majority of voters in this election view Joe Biden's presidency as a failure. She just owned all of it. All of it. And that is a miracle if you happen to be someone who's supporting Donald Trump. Now, uh, miracles do not abound when it comes to the federal government very often. And... Uh, there's no lack of failures as we've seen. Let me give you a couple, a little bit of a taste of this. This is back in June. This is Mayorkas talking about FEMA and how they're totally, totally, totally ready for this hurricane season. FEMA is tremendously prepared. This is what we do. This is what they do. And the key here, Rebecca, is also to make sure that the communities who are potentially impacted are prepared as well. And it's not just hurricanes uh, and Fire, wildfires, also extreme heat, which certainly some parts of the United States are already experiencing. Certainly. So they're ready. They're ready for this hurricane season. Now, they also kind of threw something out that made you think, are they are you sure they're ready about uh, for this? Listen to this. We are concerned about the funding, just as we were concerned last year, Rebecca. We expect the disaster relief fund, which is the critical fund that we use uh, to resource impacted communities. We expect it will run out by mid-August, and we need Congress to fund the disaster relief fund. Guys, they're out of money. They just don't have any money. Now, you might say, didn't we give $100 billion to Ukraine or something? Like, what do you mean we're out of money? Um, also, aren't we constantly using FEMA funds uh, to, uh, to go after and, and, and support the illegal immigrants that come to this country, and yet we're out of money for our own people? How does this work exactly? Tom Cotton was talking about this a little bit uh, on NBC. My broader question to you, I think, is about this misinformation. Do you think this is a time to put falsehoods aside, like the idea that FEMA funds are being redirected to migrants, which is just no. not true? Well it is true that, that FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security have been spending billions of dollars on migrants. Now, I understand some people say they're separate funds, yeah. but we, we just passed a short-term spending bill. It's very common for the administration to come and ask for permission to move money between funds, especially to prepare for emergencies. And, and second, I, I would note that this administration seems to have no problem finding money when they want to spend it on their priorities. When they need hundreds of billions of dollars to pay off student loans for graduate students in gender studies mm -hmm. programs, they somehow find it. When yeah. it's trying to get helicopters to deliver food yeah. and water and cellular service and life-saving medicine into these mountain valleys, they somehow can't seem to find the money. It's so weird how that happens. And of course, there's Corinne Jump here, who yesterday, I guess, got a promotion. Special advisor to the president or something like that. That's, uh, that's uh, high praise, by the way. You notice, by the way, she's never worn the same outfit twice. We've uncovered that already. Uh, by the way, if you're on our YouTube channel, you can go look at the bit in the comedy bit section about how she's never worn the same uh, outfit twice. A full investigation of that. I think you'll appreciate it. Um, but here is a KJP uh, talking about FEMA and migrants and all this, all these funds that are, they swear don't go to migrants. They promise you they don't go to migrants, except they totally go to migrants. It's just categorically full. No, Biden did not take uh, FEMA relief uh, money to use, uh, to use on migrants. 
So FEMA regional administrators have been meeting with city officials on site to coordinate to coordinate available federal uh, support from FEMA and other uh, federal agencies. Funding is also available through FEMA's emergency food and shelter program to eligible local governments and non-for-profit non organizations upon request uh, to support humanitarian relief for migrants. A couple things about those clips. If you're listening on podcast, uh, the first one was from 2024, her getting angry that anyone would accuse her of such things, uh, FEMA giving money to migrants, and then in 2022 when she was bragging about it. Um, that's that. Uh, the other thing about that um, video and uh, clips, both of them, every single word of both clips was read. So this was not like a mistake where she screwed this up. She was reading off of a page, as she always does, the entire time you heard her speaking. The other thing about it is she wears a lot of eyeshadow. And I, uh, the only reason I know that is because she's always looking down at a piece of paper. So I see the back of her eyelids almost all the time. Uh, whenever she's speaking, you are, uh, she's the first person. My wife yelled at me yesterday because she's like, do you even know what eyeshadow is? Honestly, never really noticed it. You know, just never really noticed it on anyone. I notice it on her because, first of all, there's a, you know, my wife's like, they, she really, they, I don't like Corinne Jean-Pierre, but she does do a good job with her makeup. Okay, uh, she does. It, 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 I will say it shows uh, that she spends time on it. But also, you'd have to spend time on it because your eyes are always looking down like this. And then people get to see your, uh, the back of your eyelids all the time. Glenn suggested perhaps she paint an eyeball on the back of the eyelids. So it looks like she's awake and not reading the entire time. It looks like the eye is going at you. I don't know if that's something she wants to uh, look into. Um, now, look, FEMA is not only spending money on migrants. It's also wasting your money on nonsensical DEI bullcrap like equity, right? One of the things they've talked about a lot is the Disaster equity. What is disaster equity exactly? Let's go through some of this. This is from the FEMA website. I'm not like reading into comments. This is something they spent a year working on to try to make sure they can get equity worked into disaster management for whatever reason. Um, here is the executive order. On January 20th, 2021, President Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. released executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government requiring that agencies assess equity with respect to race, ethnicity, religion, income, geography, gender identity, sexual orientation, and disability. Under the leadership of Administrator Criswell, we have, that sounds like a bad Star Wars character, uh, we have a uh, undertaken initiatives to expand access so more people are better able to access our response, recovery, and resilience programs. We're turning a page at FEMA and infusing equity throughout our agency programs and policies to better serve people who face unique barriers before, during, and after disaster, said uh, Administrator Criswell. And then she said, it's a trap! Um, there's also uh, more nonsensical, I mean, we can go on and on and on if you like, we are committed to delivering better services to marginalized and other vulnerable populations. The communities face systemic barriers and are disproportionately affected by climate change. I mean, systemic and disproportionately, you know you're at some dumb DEI meeting whenever you hear those two, two, two words. No one ever uses disproportionately or systemic in basically any other way. So you know uh, almost always that's the case. It's, of course, a laudable goal to be able to help um, areas of the country that are, um, uh, that are hard hit by a storm and are vulnerable to a storm. Like maybe, um, you know, if you have a business district with a bunch of high rises, you're going to spend maybe a little bit less resources than a bunch of trailers at a trailer park when people are getting knocked over and maybe killed a lot more easily. But at the end of the day, you go where the need is. You don't like, hey, we got a bottle of water here. Wait, what are your genitals? Hold on, let me get a little closer. I can't quite tell your skin color before I give you this bottle of water. That's insane. It's insane. And it's while they might not be doing that on a day to day, moment to moment barrier uh, basis, and I know a lot of the people who work for FEMA or who are out there in the fields are doing uh, what they can, but they're under a leadership structure that doesn't care about the same things they care about. And that's a real problem. The 2022 to 2026 FEMA strategic plan, released in December 2021, outlines a bold vision and three ambitious goals designed to address key challenges the agency faces during a pivotal moment in the field of emergency management. The goals are to instill equity 
as a foundation. That's goal number one. Instill equity as a foundation of emergency management. Lead the whole of a community in climate resilience. Again, this is not responding to an emergency. This is implementing left-wing climate fever dreams and promote a, and sustain a ready FEMA and prepared nation. That one is kind of what you'd think FEMA should be, but it's the third freaking priority. And honestly, like the other two are BS. The importance of equity in emergency management is not a new concept. We know that historically underserved communities experience differences in preparedness and mitigation measures, as well as how quickly their communities can resume social and economic life after a disaster. FEMA will con continue to integrate, in integrate equity. These are just the words that normal people don't use, and I'm, I'm blowing them. Um, as a foundation of our climate through trans transformational change within our workforce, across our programs, and throughout the emergency management community, the agency will also direct resources and routinely evaluate our programs and policies to help reduce barriers to access and to achieve equitable outcomes that benefit all communities, blah, 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 blah. Nonsense. Go to the places where the trees fell down and help the people. Don't care about what color they are, how much money they have, what, uh, what genitals they care, what, where they decide to put their genitals. None of that's important. None of it. And this is the thing with the DEI stuff. We've talked a lot about, let's say, women's sports, for example. And women's sports is really important, uh, the way that men are playing in women's sports. It is an important issue. I don't mean to demean it at all. Uh, I know if my daughter was losing her third place you know, medal to, and going into fourth, I'd be really pissed about it. And it's understandable. But taking it, looking at it from a, maybe a bigger perspective, what the women's sports issue does is highlight bigger issues, right? It highlights bigger issues. Like if you start taking these things that we're doing now in girls' sports and moving them into our military or our emergency management, then you're starting to cost people their lives, not their medals, but their lives. That is what's actually happening in FEMA. They are focused. And, and like, by the way, did I mention, when I read that first thing, the executive order. I don't even know if I mentioned it. Let me read it to you one more time. You don't have to bring the graphic up. I'll just read it to the people. Eh, sorry, I've got all my stuff all spread out all over the place. Here it is. On January 20th, 2021, President Joseph R. Biden Jr. released executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities. What stands out to you on that? January 20th, 2021. This was something he did on his first day in office. He got inaugurated and then he turned FEMA into a DEI factory. How can you take these people seriously? There are people who are dying in North Carolina and Georgia. There are people who probably, sadly, will die in Florida because of the storm and will probably suffer because people like Joe Biden and Mayorkas and Kamala Harris are going to look around and try to track down the proper skin color to give aid to. This is not supposed to be the way it works. Treat people equally and fairly and with the respect they deserve. That respect is equal. It's not equity we're looking for. It's equality. And if we can get to that place, the rest of the stuff sorts itself out. Going online without ExpressVPN is like leaving your laptop unattended at the coffee shop while you run to the bathroom. I mean, most of the time it's probably fine. Probably no one will steal your laptop. But then one day you come back and your laptop is gone. Every time you connect to an unencrypted uh, network in cafes and hotels and airports and places like that, your online data is not secure. Any hacker on the same network can gain access to and steal your personal data, your passwords, your bank logins, your credit card details, stuff like that. You don't want that to happen. I mean, sometimes it doesn't even take, uh, honestly, uh, someone with a lot of technical uh, knowledge to do this. A smart 12-year-old uh, could do that. And smart 12-year-olds can be incredibly evil if you catch the wrong one. Damien comes to mind. Uh, this is why you need ExpressVPN. I, I, like, a lot of people are like, a VPN seems really, really difficult. I, I don't want to deal with it. I don't know computers. I don't know all that stuff. I don't, I'm not going to be able to work that. I want to show you real quick. This is ExpressVPN. It's on my phone. I have my app on it all the time. And see how it's red on the top right now? I'm not on ExpressVPN. I just click this one button like that, and now it turns green. And now I'm on ExpressVPN. 
It's like legitimately that easy. If you don't want your data stolen, ExpressVPN is just the thing to keep it from happening. Secure your online data today. Visit expressvpn.com slash stew. Expressvpn.com slash stew. E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash stew. You get an extra three months free right now. Expressvpn.com slash stew. I'm joined once again by Steve Baker, investigative journalist and Blaze media correspondent. He has a new piece out on the Blaze today. Check it out. Capitol Police were sacrificial pawns on January 6th. They didn't give an S about what had happened. I'll tweet out a link to uh, that shortly. Steve, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate thanks it. for having me, Stu. Yeah, I mean, this is incredible. This kind of relates to your documentary you're working on with Harry Dunn, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, walk us through the story. Well, this story is something I actually wrote over a year ago, but that was back before I was with The Blaze, and it was in my, it was on my blog. It was a series I did about the Capitol Police. Uh, it was actually what kind of brought me to the attention of our editor-in-chief, uh, Matt Peterson, here yeah. at The Blaze, as I was working on developing that. And this was, you know, a two-year process for me putting this together, interviewing Capitol Police officers. Uh, we're talking about both off the record and on the record. There were some whistleblowers that came out, which we, we quote in the article, and then, of course, some guys behind the scene that are still there and they can't talk openly because the Capitol Police have them under non-disclosure agreements, that sort of thing. So it's, it's been a lot of work uh, to put this together. But the bottom line is, is that almost to a man and a woman, those who were the frontline officers there on January 6th believe that they were set up. And mm. if you ask me the follow up that question, yeah. who set them Ooh, up? Yeah, I think I know, but that's part of what the ongoing investigations are looking at is to connect the final remaining dots. Okay, well, until we get there, describe what you mean by being set up. How were they set up? Well, the, fir the first and the most obvious thing, and this has even been discussed uh, widely, even within mainstream uh, press articles and, and, and coverage, is that they were, the Capitol Police, they were wolf woefully uh, undermanned that day. Now, the question is, is th was that a product of just the COVID regime that they were still under at that time? Sure. Because we're talking about at, on January 6th, they had roughly 2,000 uniformed officers that they could have called upon. But for instance, the, uh, the Capitol Police Lieutenant, Lieutenant Tarek Johnson, who famously evacuated the Senate and the House without permission from mm. command mm -hmm. uh, and got in trouble for that. He, uh, he told me himself that he had less than 200 officers available to him that day, and he was in charge of internal security that day of the Capitol. 10%. Yes, 10%. 10 percent of what they could have and, had. And in my very first article that I wrote a week after January 6th, that's exactly what I identified with my own eyes. I said that I estimated that there was 200 or less actual Capitol Police officers there before they were reinforced by Metropolitan Police and other state police and other law enforcement agencies that arrived throughout the day. That makes no sense, especially because of what we now know from this IG report that came out right. recently that, you know, Donald Trump wanted more people there. He, in the days leading up to January 6th, seemed to sense some sort of danger. And the way he phrased it, I don't know if you know this quote off the top of your head, but the way he phrased it, it was like, it could have been danger of, to the building. It could have been danger to the protesters themselves right. from other protesters. He didn't know what it was, but he just wanted it to be locked down. He wanted it, what he said was, he said, I want everyone to be safe. He actually used the word safe. I actually saw one critic say, oh, he never even says the word safe. And I'm like, what? What do you mean he doesn't use the word safe? We all use the word safe. Right, right, right. But, but they said and that, that was, it was the source of this was an opponent of his, like someone who hates Donald Trump, right. Mark Milley. That's right. Milley and who we thought was a, a friendly of, of Trump's was his appointed um, acting secretary of defense at the time, Christopher, Chris Miller. I mean, he had just been appointed two months before the conclusion of the administration mm -hmm. to, to kind of see it the rest of the way out. Right. But he, behind the scenes, in uh, on the, uh, well, under oath transcripted interviews with the committee, he actually was very critical and actually said that there was no way that under his watch he was going to allow the president to have command or have control over military forces that day. He actually said that. Hmm. So he, so Isn't Trump, we know Trump asked for this, for, for forces to be there to keep people safe. And we know he didn't get them. So 
you know, where does that fall down? Is it Miller's fault? Where, where does that, where does the... the... I, I am convinced through everyone that we've spoken to, and uh, we have a, a very high-ranking uh, Pentagon official who came on the record with Blaze. Uh, that's uh, former Assistant Secretary of the Army, Casey Wardensky. He was actually on the teleconference call on January 6th with the Pentagon generals, two three-star generals, one four-star general, as well as the uh, D.C. National Guard commanders. And it was on that call that the Pentagon generals, under the command of Mark Milley, mm. said, no, we don't like the optics of the uh. National Guard being up there. This was, this was an hour after the, after the assaults had began. I mean, the, 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 the battle was fully engaged, and they said, no, we don't like the optics. That's where that phrase came from. Mm, that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, you've been looking at, in, to all of this uh, from the beginning, going through, I mean, <laughs> I've talked to you, zillions, if that's a word, uh, zillions of hours of footage. Yeah. Um, and one of the things you've been working on is this documentary. It's a three-part documentary mm -hmm. on Harry Dunn. Remind people who Harry Dunn is again. Yeah, Harry Dunn is singularly the most famous uh, police officer to ever come out of the Capitol Police. Uh, he rose to fame uh, anonymously at first because he gave an anonymous interview to BuzzFeed in the just two or three days following the Capitol in which he claimed that he had been assaulted by the N-word on numerous occasions throughout the day. And once he was publicly outed, and of course, by the way, he was in violation of Capitol Police policy to be able to be giving a politically charged interview in the first place. Right, right. Once he was outed um, as he was the one, as being the one who gave that BuzzFeed interview, then that story began to develop and embellish and it became a situation where he, he claimed at one point that 20, 30, 40, as many, this is, I'm quoting him, as many as 50 people were chanting the N-word at him. Now that would be something that other people would notice. Well, it was not only something that other people would notice, he gave us the exact location and the time when it happened, <laughs> mm -hmm. which of course gives us the opportunity to go look at CCTV and prove that it did not happen, as well as all of the other open source video that's come out in the trials now through trial discoveries that have the audio on it from people's cell phone cameras. Right. And so it, it's something that did not take place. Now, look, was the N-word used that day? Absolutely. I mean, were people carrying com Confederate flags, okay? <laughs> not many. Not many, but there was a few. But there were. Mm -hmm. Uh, the most famous one that was the guy that carried it through the rotunda. Of course, he was from Delaware. <laughs> it's a strange thing to advocate is the Confederacy when right, you're right. in Delaware. Yeah. So, but but the, but these Joe Biden's home state, by the way. Right. Uh, that's why there. I brought it up. <laughs> but it's but it's nevertheless. Um, you can't have hundreds of thousands of people and not have some racists in the crowd. It's See, there's always going to be a terrible person somewhere saying something. But like, that's not, I mean, that doesn't support 50 people chanting it. There's no, no. evidence of that. None, none, none whatsoever. And then all the other versions of the story have been negated by the video evidence as well. In Harry Dunn's case, though, he rose to fame on the basis of the N-word story, and then he becomes a media darling because that really comports with their preferred narrative about sure. what happened that day, that everybody was racist, everybody was white supremacist, et cetera, et cetera. And then he became a darling with the January 6th Select Committee, which he testified under oath. Well, now we know by the video evidence that most of what he said to that committee was not, that was not factual. Then... He testified in the trials. We have the trial transcripts. I was there. And in addition to not only him changing his story between his FBI interviews to what he said in the trial transcripts, to now we have his book. And then Congress granted me hundreds of hours of access to the Capitol CCTV. I don't have any personal animosity towards former officer Harry Dunn, except to the extent that he was allowed to, in fact, I believe that he was, his perjury was suborned by the Department of Justice, yes, I just said that, and he was suborned to change his story about the Oath Keepers, the encounter he had with them that day, and that's what got me focused on him to, to begin with, was going to the story about the Oath Keepers, and then as, as I expanded my video viewing of him earlier in the morning right. and then later into the afternoon and the evening, it turns out that almost nothing he said about that day is correct. Yeah, if I remember right, not only did there's no evidence of this chanting of N-words and this assault he's talking about, but also he wasn't even in the right the same room. He wasn't even there at the time. That's correct. Not even there. 
Uh, but 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 it, everything about his day <laughs> yes. is the way it is. Just his arrival in the morning. He claims that he was in a. He, he spends six pages in his book describing this morning roll call briefing. Mm -hmm. Gave us the exact location in the Capitol where this briefing happened. Just so happens there's two cameras in that room. Nobody was ever in that room all day. I mean, what, why would you lie about that? That doesn't make any sense. And then we have the testimony from the Capitol Police officers that were also frontline officers, uh, or what they call their first responders unit. They're all, got, we didn't have a roll call briefing that morning. We were still under COVID, uh, you know, regime. So wild. All right, let, we got, you know, one minute left. Um, is this having any effect? I mean, and you see like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and all these people making this argument that January 6th is the reason you should vote against Donald Trump. Is this having any effect in the election? This is, this is why this story is important. Two reasons. Number one, it shows the tremendous amount of disinformation, purposeful and lies that were that were given to us, the American public, from that committee that you just referred to, the mm -hmm. House January 6th Select Committee. Mm -hmm. It also shows us the ineptitude of GOP and their committees because those officers who I've interviewed who have perjured themselves in trial, who have proven it absolutely, no doubt about it, mm -hmm. we've, we've got them dead to rights. Why hasn't the Judici Judiciary Committee called them to testify under oath and get this out before the American people? Because they put people in prison for decades as a result of those lies. You're asking a question. Do you know the answer to it? I, I think I do. I've done a story on it. Mm. All right, we're going to get to that uh, maybe next time when you're on. Yeah. We're out of time for today. Steve Baker, be sure to check out his new piece on the blaze. It's Capitol Police were sacrificial pawns on January 6th. They didn't give an S about what happened. I will uh, tweet out a link to that uh, sh shortly here. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Appreciate Steve. it. Imagine for a moment that you're about to make the biggest financial decision that most people make in their entire lives, Hi buying or selling a home. That's the biggest thing. I mean, you can make all these investments, you make a little bit here, you lose a little bit there, but like buying or selling a home is really how Americans at least fund their retirements, right? Like we all have this nest egg. We want to have something to hand down. We want to have a uh, retirement later on in life. But if you screw up a, a sale of a home or a purchase of a home, you could be behind the eight ball for a very long time. Well, you don't have to imagine having the best help on your side. You could just get it. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Realestateagentsitrust.com pairs you with the best real estate agent in your area, someone who knows the best practices, someone who understands the housing market like it is right now, someone who is a leader and a closer and someone you can actually trust. If you're thinking about buying or selling a home or both, please get in touch with them. You're, you're, gonna, you're not going to regret it, and you'll see what I mean. Go to realestateagentsitrust.com. The name says it all. It's realestateagentsitrust.com, a free service to you, realestateagentsitrust.com. We take polling averages. We take uh, election models. We take prediction markets, and we put them all into a big sort of soup, and it comes out with the PulseCast. This is a summary of all mainstream data experts, um, and, uh, you know, it's not my opinion as to what's going to happen, but it is the opinion of the mainstream and data community. And right now shows uh, some progress here for Donald Trump. This is, by the way, everything you see on this graph is a to toss-up. Like, it, the differences between these two candidates right now are incredibly small. Donald Trump is now into the absolute pure toss-up category. 46% chance of winning. Kamala Harris, about a 54% chance of winning. So razor thin. There's really not, not much. By the way, the prediction markets have now turned to, favor, to, to have Donald Trump be the favorite with about 53%. Uh, uh, of him, uh, a chance for him to be the president. Um, the polling averages and the um, election models are running a little bit behind that, but you see uh, how close this thing is. It is right on the uh, on the fringes. And you think, well, why isn't Kamala just blowing away Donald Trump? I mean, he's a racist, fascist, uh, communist, whatever. And uh, <laughs> that's what they all tell us, right? Why isn't she, uh, he just, you know, she just winning and defeating him easily. Well, part of it is like, she, you know, she's part of this administration that has really screwed things up to the extent that now your mega millions ticket, which is like the only way you can afford a Biden economy. Now, even the cost of that is going up. Mega millions lottery, more than doubling the price of a ticket to five bucks. It was two. 
and now it's going all the way up to five bucks. This is something, of course, difficult for Kamala Harris to deal with. Not necessarily the lottery prices, but the inflation has been a very difficult thing. She was on 60 Minutes last night, and she was definitely a little bit flustered. Of course, you know, the 60 Minutes thing, they do a good job editing. So they edited it out like one of her word salad answers to one of the questions. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's set up as like a news package, so it's a lot easier uh, for them to make her look okay. She was asked a couple of mildly difficult questions, didn't really have good answers for them. Um, I went over everything in detail of this entire interview last night on youtube.com slash America. If you go there, the video is still up there, still holds. I mean, I'm just analyzing the, video, the uh, interview. So if you haven't seen it, if you want to after the show, click on over there and, you know, it, I, I take care of the entire interview about 20 minutes. You get every detail you're going to need on it and probably a lot more. Uh, Kamala Harris also joined The View today, first uh, live interview since becoming the presidential nominee. And, you know, to say it went deliciously is to understate it because I have been you have heard this rant how many times I mentioned it earlier on the show, but I want to bring your attention to it again. When the, the question I've been begging somebody to ask Kamala Harris is what would you do differently? What would you have done differently? Give me a few examples of things that you thought Joe Biden was wrong on. Uh, give me an example of a policy you tried to pursue. And Joe Biden was like, no, we're not pursuing that. What would you have done differently over the past four years? Finally, someone answered it. And I don't know how, but it was on The View. Well, if, if anything, would you have done something differently than President Biden during the past four years? Uh, there is not a thing that comes to mind in terms of, and I've been a part of, of, of most of the decisions that have had impact. Uh, I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. Um, not only did she take, say that she wouldn't do, done anything differently, she said she was involved in all the decisions. So she actually doubled down on it. This is the Biden presidency. The overwhelming percentage of people think Joe Biden's presidency is a failure. The key for, Joe, uh, for Donald Trump to, of winning this election is to convince people that she is actually the vice president of the United States. It should be easy, but it apparently isn't so far. Uh, that's kind of a big thing. In fact, I've got a good example. As, uh, for one thing, maybe you might want to do differently next time. This is just a recommendation to Kamala Harris. I'll give it to you in a moment. Do you think our country is going in the right direction or does it feel like everything is falling apart? If you're feeling alarmed, you're not alone. In fact, Americans from all walks of life have taken action to prepare for whatever is coming next. I mean, think about these storms. The one that's going into Florida right now, the one that just hit uh, Georgia and North Carolina. This is, I mean, not having an emergency food supply can put you in severe danger. Storing food in your home is the right thing to do because, you know, look, we're living in crazy times and we don't know what's around the corner. So many people are preparing. That's the right thing to do. And you can do it with a three-month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. It comes with delicious foods like creamy stroganoff, honey wheat bread, mushroom rice pilaf, uh, lots of other stuff. Uh, the entire kit offers over 2,000 calories a day, so you could eat well. This isn't like you're starving yourself and trying to make it through the apocalypse. You eat well in the apocalypse. Uh, food lasts up to 25 years or, uh, you know, I mean, look, the good thing about that is you don't have to think about it again, right? It's 25, it's a quarter century. By the time that comes, uh, who knows? Uh, you can go back to my Patriot Supply and load up again, but you get a long time to have to worry about that. Go to preparewithstew.com. Preparewithstew.com. You got three month emergency kit going on right now from my Patriot Supply. Check it out now. Preparewithstew.com. Okay, so here's what happened. I mentioned maybe if Kamala was looking for something that she might want to do differently, she could try this. Um, you know, releasing the merchant of death. Um, if you know the movie Lord of War, which is fantastic, by the way, I love Lord of War as a movie. Um, it is about a story about a, a, an arms dealer who goes all over the world and gives weapons all over the place. And it's very, very corrupt and a t terrible, terrible story, um, you know, um, known as a mass killer. Uh, well, we traded him in a hostage deal for a basketball player. Now, that basketball player, I will say did fuel the Phoenix Mercury to a 19 and 21 record. So perhaps it was worth it. Now, look, I am legitimately happy that Brittany Griner is home. Uh, you know, I mean, of course, any American, I'm glad that they're home. But there's a real cost to this. And the Wall Street Journal is now reporting they are now selling arms to the Houthis. So these weapons will be fired at our troops and our allies. So things are going really well, America. <laughs> 